So welcome back. Now I'd like to explore what in public health is referred to as the social determinants of health. Some of you who participated in an earlier Harvard X course called Health and Society are probably pretty familiar already with something called the social determinants of health. But what the social determinants of health tries to do is help us understand why do some people engage in the activities that lead to the actual causes of death and other people don't? And how can we understand what's going on that gives some people very good health status and other people very poor? Is it just about individual behavior? And according to the public health doctrine, it is absolutely not. So here's an image that tries to illustrate the social determinants of health. And let me just give the definition from the World Health Organization. So they say the social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. These circumstances are shaped by the distribution of money, power, and resources at the global, national, and local levels. And so what we can see from this chart is we can see what are the factors that influence whether we are healthy or not. So first at the bottom, there is you and me and all of us, our own behavior, what we do, what we don't do. And that's an important factor in terms of how healthy we are or how not healthy we are. But it's not just about us. That's the essential point to understand. It's also about our families, our social networks. I mean, if you're in a family where all the adults smoke, you are much more likely to smoke than if you're in a household where they don't. It's your social relationships, your groups, your networks at school or wherever as you're growing up and as you live that have a significant relationship between how healthy you are. One of the things we understand is that folks who are overweight or obese are more likely to hang out with other folks who are overweight and obese. And so there's a power in that relationship. There's also a power in communities and how communities are organized and what the culture is. You remember in the first session, we gave a definition for the word culture. And the word culture is, the definition I like is, the way we do things around here, wherever here may be. And so quite honestly, if you live in some parts of the country of the United States, as I'll show you in a couple of minutes, you're much more likely to, for example, have a diet and an exercise pattern that is healthier for you or less healthy. So communities matter. And then, of course, society matters, what society does. So, for example, lots of people in the United States get injured or killed every year through firearms. That's a societal choice that America makes. It's its own decision. Other societies make different choices about how easily accessible firearms are. And that has an impact on people's lives. Not so much even, well, very much so if you get injured by somebody else in a firearm incident, but also, for example, the suicide rate and your ability to take your own life is significantly enhanced by the easy availability of firearms. So that's a societal choice. And then, of course, there's more than that. There's intergovernmental, regional, global determinants of health. For example, uh, phenomena like climate change uh, have a significant impact on human health. And the ability to influence that is only marginally in the hands of any national government or any society itself. Any real activity and the causes of that are global if we want to try to address it in some way or not. But so all of these pieces come together and as you see the line on the right, it goes from the micro, you and me, up to the macro. And all of those are part of determining how healthy we are or how unhealthy we are. So what does this tell us about what to do? So if we look at this next chart, what we see is something that the Centers for Disease Control, this is the, uh, the current director, Tom Frieden, came up with called the CDC's Health Impact Pyramid. And it is, where do you make the greatest contribution in terms of improving health? And it's not that any one of these is wrong and any one of these is right, but it's just understanding. So you start at the top where we have individual effort is the focus. 
And so counseling and education is an example of an approach that tries to get people to change what they do at the individual level. Some people think all we have to do is tell people to do the right thing. Don't drink and drive. Try to eat right. Try to exercise more. And that's all it should take. And society has no business doing anything else. And that's a values argument and dispute in all societies and very much in the U.S. society right now. But so that's one place. And so an example of that is just saying, eat healthy and be active. Now, if we want to have a bigger impact, then we try to create some clinical interventions. So we create a clinical intervention, for example, that allows you to test what your blood cholesterol level is. And if you find that you've got a total blood cholesterol over 200, then you've got some issues. And so if that's readily available and easy, then it's easier for you to act as an individual, and it's easier for society to figure out other things potentially to do. So we go even more, we go to long-lasting preventive interventions, like, for example, immunizations, where we don't just test people one at a time, but we create programs that provide broader societal disease protection. So we know, for example, in areas of the country where people are refusing to get immunizations for their children, that we're seeing, for example, for the first time in like about 50 years, we're seeing measles outbreaks again coming around the country. And that is uh, part of what we try to prevent with these kinds of protective interventions. Then we go down one level more, and we go to changing the context to make individuals' default decisions healthier. There's actually a branch of economics that focuses on this as their passion. It's called behavioral economics, and it's become very popular over the past five to 10 years. Its roots go back to the 1970s, but it says we need to create an environment where it's easier for people to do the things that make sense. So for example, if you put in a supermarket the healthy foods at the eye level, if you put the healthy foods where you get first and you put the unhealthy stuff later on, people are more likely based upon behavioral economics experiments and studies to do the better choice rather than the less healthy choice. And so then we come to the bottom part of the pyramid where we can have the greatest impact and that addresses the socioeconomic factors that determine whether you are likely to be healthy or unhealthy. And what are those? Poverty, education, housing, inequality. So if you are poor, you are more likely to be less healthy. If you have bad or inadequate education, you are more likely to be less healthy. If you have bad housing, you are more likely to be unhealthy. And if you face some other situation of significant inequality, you also have the risk of being significantly less healthy. And so we want to address the issues at the individual level. We want to address all of the different parts of the pyramid. And the important contribution of public health is understanding that it is the socioeconomic factors at the bottom that, in fact, are some of the greatest determinants of whether you and your family are healthy or not, and also provide the guide and the direction for how to address the health status and problems that Americans are facing.